right. So this is uh, episode six, and I've got on Ben Jones, a serial entrepreneur and international keynote speaker. And there's a lot of other things to add to that too. So um, I'll let you sort of give us a brief sort of, you know, tell of all, what, what, what do you do, what you're about. Cool. Um, yeah. So look, thanks for having us on, Justin. Really appreciate you being here and, um, you know, hopefully connecting with your audience. Uh, also, guys, hopefully I can help you in some way. I appreciate your attention that you guys are sharing, uh, listening today. And um, yeah, let's let's get into it. So, uh, did you want me to give a little bit about me? Is that what yeah, that yeah, a bit of a backstory, a bit of backstory for me. So yeah, look, um, basically, I guess as a young person growing up on a farm, I was quite entrepreneurial. My dad had a rule that you were either going to uni or getting a trade before you left home or college, if you like, um, which I did. And long, cut a very long story short, I made the the road to becoming entrepreneurial, even though I was an entrepreneurial kid, leaving the job and starting different businesses and things. And um, yeah, I guess for me, one of the big things was, uh, you know, we ended up buying a whole bunch of online businesses. That's how I got into business, um, you know, I don't know, many years ago. And um, we sold all of those up. And like as a part of that, you know, I hated mobile phones and technology and all of that, um, but I had to quickly adapt. And uh, it worked out quite well, but I guess the one thing I did notice was where I really needed to understand marketing. So that was, you know, like nothing happens. You can have like the best business ever, but if no one knows you, you become that best kept secret, right? So that, that is that is the problem. And um, look, we sold those off and my, <laughs> um, basically my wife and I were like, what do we do now? My son at the time, um, we'd started a little business with him just in the backyard. He was growing herbs and getting door knocking at the age of eight. And uh, people were asking us, you know, like, how do you do that with our kids? So we created an online business, which is called Youth in Business, teaching kids how to start their own businesses, which is really fun. And um, that that went grew pretty quickly. You know, we were starting to do events in most capital cities of Australia. It's like five to 700 people. Oh, wow. We ended up doing it in the UK as well just prior to COVID and um, yeah, we had some kids get some great results, you know, like kids doing, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of dollars a month all the way to buying houses before they're 18. Um, wow. All the way That's through to so like cool. one, of, one of our kids wrote a book, you know, how I make more money than my principal, right? So it's, it's like, <laughs> I uh, love that title. That's it's such like a totally good cool. title. I know. I was lucky enough to write the forward, right? So, yeah. um, so what's really cool is, you know, like that, that was very meaningful and we're able to help a lot of kids and like even today like my kids have their own businesses everyone because I've got four kids all of them except for my three-year-old um, and I'm really like quite passionate about teaching the next generation about marketing oh, sorry about marketing and also about business and learning that they can sell and we, we do this thing in there called um, the $20 challenge we literally get the kids to start with $20 and see you know uh, how much they can turn that to in their first month right and most kids now would do over a thousand dollars in their first month. Wow! And off twenty dollars, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. That's impressive. And, and I think, like, just this is like, they're willing to get out there and sell. And as as adult business owners, we want to create the better plan or create, you know, plan the better thing. If you go to university, they'll tell you like you're profitable in the first year after you've done your fifty page branding guideline. You've done well, you know. Like, it's just not about that at all. We have this concept we teach them, which is just sell it before you build it, get out there and make the sale and build the business around it. Right. Mm. And, um, and I guess for me, like another thing that I'm quite passionate about there is if, you know, if everyone learned, if they were down to the last $20, they could go out there and even if they could turn it into a hundred dollars, there'd be no need for like welfare or homelessness or anything. Right. Mm. Cause everyone would have that skill. The self-sufficiency. A hundred percent. Right. Like, so for me, like I'm quite passionate about teaching the next generation about entrepreneurship and uh, particularly because myself, like it was something, it was never an option for me. It was like, business is risky. Don't do that. Um, you know, I think for a long time there, my parents were just waiting for me to go back and get a real job. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah. obviously not so much anymore, but you know, that, that was very much the attitude of like middle-class Western society, if that makes mm. sense. Yeah. hundred um, percent. So that's a little bit of backstory about youth in business. Obviously I also run another company called Titan Marketing. We teach people about how to grow and scale their business with YouTube ads um, and that grew out of just being super frustrated with Facebook probably about five years ago. And it's even more frustrating today. Mm, yeah. It's getting harder and harder. <laughs> harder and harder. So we, we made the move, uh, you know, then, and 
around the same time I had, you know, um, friends of mine who were, you know, pretty serious business people speaking from stage, that sort of thing. They'd get me to come speak on marketing and, you know, then I'd have people say, oh, can you come run my marketing? And, and it was kind of an organic thing that just happened on the side. And um, so we did and, you know, that went really well. And then COVID hit and we couldn't fly or present or speak from stage and had a couple other businesses doing that. And, um, yeah, we just we just started, you know, managing some YouTube ads, helping people get their YouTube ads off the ground. And that sort of brings us to where we are today. But it was in the backstory of how we got over to Google ads from Facebook, like a, we had this room, like we had a room for youth in business that we wanted to fill, um, you know, to like five, 700 people, which is a bit of a marketing undertaking. Mm. And um, as we were doing it, like Facebook canceled all our accounts again and it happened like five or six times and I just couldn't deal. I was actually flying out to China like the next day and I just rang around some agencies. I'm like, Hey man, run me some Google ads. I need traffic on this thing like yesterday. And I don't know if you know, but if you go to China, you can't check in on Google or Facebook or any of that, right? So I've heard about that. Yes, yes. They're a bit more strict in terms of crazy. what you can access. It's crazy. So so anyway, so I left this agency up to it and they did an okay job. But being a marketer, I came home. I was like, oh, I could hell do better than that. Yeah, I can, I can imagine. I can imagine. <laughs> and uh, and and that's really how that's really how that how that grew, you know. So um, yeah, so. And then, you know, we've had other businesses along the way as well. But, I mean, that's a really quick, like, you know, 30-second reel of the whole deal. But, yeah, um, yeah, it's, it's really fun. So so you grew up on a farm. Um, that gap between getting into technology from there and because you, 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 you had a couple other online businesses in the beginning, right? How, yeah, yeah. how did that happen? How did that you know yeah it's crazy that, that like growing up on a farm like i just had no interest in and you know like i was born in the 90s so like it was all social media was all around in my you know like because it was early times. days back then like it, you know it wasn't like a real like it, even, yeah. even in the suburbs it wasn't really like you, you use a computer for barely anything really like just to, for you for a kid you just play games on it and whatever yeah know? yeah back in the you know it was nintendo and sega right like, yeah but um, I, th- I think that in my like late teens, early twenties, it was definitely out and about. Like everyone yep. was having Facebook accounts and mm. mobile phones were a massive thing, and you know all of that. And um, I actually, when I bought my first home, I was like, you know, at home, I didn't even want a phone in it, didn't want to be hassled. I just wanted to go surfing, and go to work. Right, that was my yeah. whole deal. Yeah. And um, you know, which posed a problem for my girlfriend, but you know, she'd just come down and <laughs> it'd be fine. But I guess the the problem the problem became is like later on, I got into property with my my brother. We were doing like property deals and stuff, mm. and um, he was actually the one that said, "Look, man, we need to get into buying because we wanted to buy a business." And he's like, "Let's buy online businesses." These guys, Matt and Liz Rod, and if you've heard of them, they're really cool. They're like, "Come, we'll show you how to buy online businesses," and we're like, "Oh, okay." That I was like, "Why the hell would I want to do that for? That's just the dumbest thing." Yeah. And um, <laughs> anyway, we flew over, and he talked me into it. Next thing I know, we've got like you know, it was twenty something online businesses within the space of a year. So I quickly had to like, you know, like if your belief system doesn't serve you anymore, it's time to get rid of it, right? Mm. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, got rid of that, and and then that's when I, I pretty much did like a full three hundred and sixty on it, and I was like, "This is really the future. I need to double down on this now." And um and thank goodness i did really to be perfectly honest and i mean that was a great blessing but that's that's sort of the transition right like was Mm -hmm. um i just sort of forced myself into the space and you know people that knew me were like oh my goodness how did you go from not having a phone to being like yeah uh, (laughs) yeah yeah, running online businesses yeah yeah (laughs) yeah that's what i was like that's such a big parallel there of of, because some people don't make that jump and they're just happy to live technology free or limited um and it's like like yes sometimes you if you live like that you miss out on the opportunities around it but i i completely get it like i think the more i'm involved with technology the more i'm like man i wish i didn't really have it like there's days where i'm like <laughs> i don't want a computer in front of me i don't want to be online i just want to be in, in nature somewhere but <laughs> yeah that's interesting um so your, what were the, some of the first online businesses or, or was it even before that was there anything where, you know, your, your, your sort of first sort of entrepreneurial adventure 
started? Was there any like particular thing, even like when you were young, very young as well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, as a young person, it was one of those like, it wasn't really, I mean, back then it's not, you're not really like, hey, I want to, I want to be an entrepreneur because you don't even know yeah. what it is, right? Like yeah. most of the times you're like, I just want to have money so I can buy stuff. It's mm. usually the first driver, right? So, exactly right. Um, so for me, it was like, you know, how can I do that? And it was like working on the farm. And I was like, well, I'm limited by the amount of hours that I can do here. And I'm at school mm. and, you know, I don't have many hours. So I quickly learned like that wasn't the thing. So then what I did is I was like, well, what if I grew my own crops, right? Like that could work. Mm. But then I could grow that. I could pray my brother and sisters to pick them and deal with it. And that was kind of like the first aha moment, I guess I had from like scaling yeah. from like swapping my hours to, you know, um, having an income where I wasn't relying on my time. And looking mm. back on it, I didn't make that connection at that point. It was something I realized that I did sort of like later. Yeah, yeah. Um, but from there, you know, that was seasonal. Like the problem with that was you had to wait for the season to come around, right? <laughs> um, so then what I'd do is on school holidays, I'd go up to my grandma's house who lived in the city and um, I'd cut these like lino tiles and like put cut numbers out of them like a stencil mm. i'd go door knocking and i'd just like spray numbers on people's curbs for like five or ten bucks wow a number, I've, ne- right? I've, n- I've never heard of that before i remember i was like driving past and this guy was doing it yeah. in like a city and i was like huh i thought i reckon i could do that and um yeah i just gave it a shot and like that would literally i'd make a couple hundred bucks in a day mm. doing that and that would like give me all the money i needed for my school holidays right so it then became a thing of, okay, well, I'll do that, you know, first day of school holidays, then I'll have enough money to go and, and it was good in a way because my parents were never like, they, they never really gave us money. It was like, well, you can mm. work on the farm or you can do this or you do that. So you had to be creative in that way. And I think yeah. that was good. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, that's what I did and I just went out there and would do that. So that's probably like early, early days. Mm. And then I kind of got trapped in the employment rat race cycle for about, eight years after that um, Mm. because, you know, you got into having a job and career and whatever else. Um, But then it was very much like you start reading a few books like Rich Dad, Poor Dad or like trying to understand how money works and that sort of Mm. thing. And um, and then from there I was like, yeah, I need to, I need to get into business in some way. How do I do that? That was after we'd already played around in the property space. And so that was sort of the journey. Mm. Um, Biggest regret was I wish, someone had have told me earlier, you know, like sat me down at like late teens, early twenties and said, look, you can start a side business or, or something. You don't have to be great at it, but this is definitely a skill worth learning, you know? Mm. And um, that probably would have saved me a decade of yeah. life. But I, think, but I think, but I think like doing back then, like only now have I really seen more and more of that idea being sort of shared around like the last couple of years, um, you know, back when I sort of was it started or not even then back earlier when I was still studying and stuff. No one talked about that. That wasn't a thing that didn't really exist. No one was really pushing that sort of concept to, to you know, young people. It, it was more just the, like the same thing, get a good education, go to uni or whatever, get a degree or whatever go work for a place, get a good job, employment, have security. That was just, I don't know, that, that's the only thing I ever heard, you know, growing up when I was, I was younger. There wasn't really, oh, you know what? You could do this on the side, you know what I mean? Do it yourself, you know. Um, yeah, it's just, yeah, I don't, I don't think that really existed then. So it's hard to say, like, you know, who was to push you or who was to put that idea in your mind during that time period. I, only now, uh, you, you know, these kids uh, have that availability of people just, you know, entrepreneur this, like that That word is so, so thrown around now compared to the last couple of years. Yeah, 100%. I think it's way more cooler to be a business owner and entrepreneur. And people use the word entrepreneur pretty loosely, I feel. Yes, um, it's true. So, so, um, <laughs> I agree. So, but yeah, like it's a, it's a cool thing now, whereas probably 15 years ago, it was kind of, it was like, a, why are you doing that? You know, like, um, I mean, that's a good thing in a way, but um, yeah, as a, mm-hmm. I think the internet's helped a lot with it as well. So, yeah. you know, when you said, uh, you know, you, you probably weren't consciously aware of it at the time when you were younger, but when you got your brother and sisters to help you on the farm and, you know, obviously paying them or, you know, 
to to sort of do the the work while you didn't have to sort of separate and manage the scaling things. Like I find that super interesting because I feel like a lot of people, even as grown adults, don't make that connection. Um, even for myself, I, that took me a while to really get that. Um, even for uh, my whole entrepreneurial journey, even as a young ki- young kid, I'd always be the person doing it. I'm the always, I'm the one selling. I'm the one you know doing this, doing that. And then only sort of recently, like, like as you get older, you sort of realize oh, I'm limited to me. Like I can only do so much, and I have to do all these other things where they're not that important, you know. But no one else is doing it, so I have to do it. But I could get someone else to do it even better faster while I do what I'm good at like that it some people don't make that connection so it was pretty cool to to hear that you sort of maybe if you didn't intentionally do it but it you sort of connected the dots at that such a young age yeah I think um and business owners suffer from it and even myself to this day you know like no one does it as good as me syndrome Mm. I like to call it you know like uh, and I think there's probably two parts to that. One is people do do it better than you. You just suck at communicating what you do, right? So, yeah, it's true. <laughs> um, you know, let's be real. They've got 14-year-olds running McDonald's, right? Because that, why? Because they've got like a really good communication and systems to make that work. And mm-hmm. um, for me, that that was a very hard lesson to learn. Like I tried a couple of times to scale with staff and failed miserably probably like two or three times uh, in mm-hmm. terms of just you know, you end up with all this stuff sitting around not doing anything and it's not working and it's disconnected. And, um, you know, to where we are today, like we've got 14 staff. I have one 30 minute meeting a day with my operations manager and that's all I have to do. Right. Mm. So, um, versus trying to, you know, basically organize, trying to herd cats with a bunch of staff. Right. So I think like some of the big things there that really helped were just like finding someone who's already built a team bigger than you, or let's build a team in general, sit down with them and be like, hey, man, how do I do this? You know, mm-hmm. and um, like we ended up doing some training and, you know, sitting down and like actually figuring out how this is supposed to be done properly and then went and did it and it was just the difference was amazing. And I think a lot of the times like, and for me in that early part, I didn't really want to, I just thought I could figure it out instead of like, putting my hand up and finding someone who'd already done the thing I wanted to do and then to pay them or show me how to do it, right? And that's just shortcut so much time, you know, in my world. So yeah, if you're struggling at the moment and you're like, hey, how do I deal with all my stuff? Like, I don't care who it is. Find someone who's already figured that or whatever problem you've got. Someone's already figured it out, right? Go ask them or pay them to show you how to figure it out. And you'll just shave years or, you know, months of time and pain and hassle off off your journey. So yeah. So do you know like when's the best time to sort of scale and, and find, you know, staff? Like when, when's that period? Like, is it, do you sort of, is it like, the, like, do you find, start looking for staff before you sort of have the workload or it gets to the point where you got the workload and it's like, I can't handle this anymore. And then yeah. look for staff. A hundred percent. So, um, so there's probably two start things to that. I think like, I think there's two phases of business. Um, it, and, you know, this is just the, according to Ben, <laughs> but, uh, mm-hmm. but one is the buy the plane before you build it or the sell it before you build it model, right? That's the, we're just in startup, you know, where we're just strapping everything on here. We're, we're making a sale and trying to figure out how to fulfill and, you know, um, making sure that we give the customer the best experience that we can. But, you know, obviously we might have to pull some more nighters. We have to fix some things like things are going to break. Right. Mm. Um, but I feel like you can have two types of problems in your business. Like one is sales based problems and the other is every other type of problem. Right. So if you're going to have a problem in your business and you're going to have them, you might as well have sales based ones, right? Uh, sales based ones are, we've got these clients. How do we fulfill or how do we deal with this or how do we get the shipping to there or like whatever it is, right? Um, now, they're a problem worth happening because someone's paid you to have that problem mm-hmm. right? versus something where someone hasn't paid you to have the problem. So, so that's the first phase. First phase is like fly the plane mm-hmm. before you build it. Like you literally strap it on the engines and like, let's go, let's go. But the thing that's driving the momentum of that plane is sales. Okay, So mm-hmm. you have to be able to figure out the sales. And whether you do that through online means like running traffic or like even you just pick up the phone through cold calls or whatever you need to do to sell, like that is 
the number one driver of success in any business is sales, right? So sales, sales, sales. So anyway, whatever that is, make the sale, get your plane flying. Now, once your plane's up and flying, like let's say, I don't know, it might set yourself a benchmark. It might be 5K, it might be 10K, it might be 100K a month, right? Mm. We usually find around the, you know, the 30K, 30 to 50K a month mark, um, usually you're going to outgrow yourself pretty quickly. Mm. So um, depending, well, in my experience, around the around the 20K a month mark, you, you're looking for staff. But by 30 to 50, it's you definitely, in most cases, you're going to be needing it, depending mm. on what your business is or whatever, right? Yeah. So um, the number one thing that we do now is, first thing I'll do if I had to start again, is I'd hire a really good operations manager. So find someone who can manage staff but can do pretty much everything in your business. So like just a go-to guy that can do most things. You know, they understand the CRM. They understand a little bit about how websites can be fixed. They understand, you know, if they need to pick up the phone and call people, they can do that. So just like a really good like all-round person Mm -hmm. and then that can hire and manage. Now that sounds really hard, but it took me like three weeks to hire my last operations manager. I interviewed heaps of people. Yeah. And one of the big things was like, I need someone who's had a business of 50 to 60, who's managed 50 to 60 staff because I only want to start with about 15 to 20 or well, 10 to 20, right? And um, and that way you pay them a little bit more, but when they come on, they they really help you grow. You know, so we went from three or four staff to like 14 or 15 or whatever many we've got now in the space of, I don't know, what do we do that? Not now because we've had these 15 staff for a long time, but let's say it's not even six months, right? Mm-hmm. So, but being able to do it really well and making sure that when they come on, you've got like, you know, the 4RR documents, they're creating, they create their own systems like and processes. So if you lose one, somebody else can step in like, That's And what I call that phase, when you're starting to hire, um, you go from selling it before you build it or building the plane while you fly it to what we call is you do it, you do it right or you do it twice. Mm -hmm. So this is where all you you iron out all the kinks, right? So, you know, all the way from you to your staff, if it's not done correctly, then you do it again. Mm -hmm. And then we have to pay for you to do it again. And it's a drama. So having the, the culture of like when you start people on like, you do it once or you do it twice. And, you know, if you end up doing it three times, well, we're going to have a conversation, right? So, yeah. um, and that's that's pretty much how I've done it. Like there might be other ways, but like a very simplistic top-end view, the, the culture needs to shift at about when you start putting on two employees or more from that, mm-hmm. you know, holy crap, batting down the hatches to, okay, now we need to like, you know, furnish the plane and put the carpet down and yeah. You know, like put the air conditioning on, and you know, let's get a bit comfortable in here, right? So, yeah. But you've got you've got the money to pay for the staff at that point. You know, you've mm. got the funds to pay for the staff, and the staff should be finding ways to add more income and and so on. So, mm. I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yes, a hundred percent. Yep. So, yeah. In terms of those initial stages for like a like a starting sort of com- like company, focus on sales. Focus on sales to that point. Don't even worry about the the other things mm-hmm. for now, um, about staff and all that. You just need to get to that point where, yeah, you can facilitate, you know, the staff and you, know, you can start actually figuring out how to add the luxuries to the plane and making the, the plane right the first time. So you're not even there yet until you start actually selling enough or doing the marketing and doing the selling to get to that stage. Yeah, and, and when you do hire, and this is a mistake I see a lot of people make as well, when you do hire, make sure that you're taking away like the time, the st- things that are like low-lying, like not, you know, like basically your activities need to go into like more high-income producing activities, right? So, for example, if you're doing social media posts and you're dealing with all of that stuff, right, that could be cool, but realistically you could be overseeing that and you could be like maybe setting up a referral offer or something like that in your business, right? Mm-hmm. But you can't do that while you're still answering comments on social media. So find someone to come in there and deal with that problem so you can do a higher level task, right? And then mm-hmm. you just want to try and replace yourself as much as possible, but like replace yourself, but then don't not do anything because then you've just created a vacuum. You need to yeah. then find like, well, what is the next high level task that I can do, right? So, mm-hmm. well, Excellent advice. Um, so 
at the moment, so you co-found um, the marketing agency and is the, the youth business co-founded or? Yeah, so we actually, I've co-founded a few businesses now. Yeah, um, so why, why uh, what's sort of the, the pros of, of, of co-founding as opposed to doing it, you know, starting yourself and being a solo owner? Yeah, look, I think it comes down to the personality, right? So like if you, if you like, you know, want to do it all your own way, then that's fantastic. Like, you know, each to their own here on this one. This is not for everybody. Mm. Um, co-founding is actually quite difficult. So um, now I've co-founded quite a few businesses and uh, look, I've had, I've had it where partnerships go wrong and, you know, I've had it where, um, you know, I've just said, look, buy me out. I've done, can't deal with you guys anymore all the way through to, Hey guys, this is going really well. Do you mind if I buy you out the, on the other side mm. and, you know, cause you know, we're putting a bit more work or whatever. And we've done that as well. So, and then to the point now where, um, you know, I've got two, well, uh, if you don't count my wife, like two really good, um, co-founder business that we've started, um, you know, even with the, the, when we bought the online businesses, the reason we stopped doing that is because my partner at the time was like, Hey man, if we sold everything right now, we'd cash out. It'd be really cool. Mm -hmm. I didn't really want to sell, but he did. Um, so we sold everything up and you know, for me, that's where youth in business started. Cause I was like, what the hell do I do now? Right. Yeah. So yeah. like, I think uh, you've got to go through a few, but I think the biggest thing, uh, if you're going to do a co-founder thing is make sure probably two things, that I think will, will really help you here. You need one, you need to be on the same page ethically. Mm. It's like, that sounds nice. And everyone is like very ethical until there's a lot of money around it. Money yeah. changes people, right? So, mm. or magnifies them in a way. Or so when things make, go bad as well. Yeah, know how they're going to react when things go bad. So, um, so for example, like, um, yeah, so make sure you're on the same ethical page. And that's important. And the other one would be um, get someone who's got complementary skills to you. So what that means is don't get don't get two people who are really good at the same thing. Mm. Okay, because uh, if you've got someone who's like big picture and really good at like you know driving the business or putting it into a place, those people usually suck at. Okay, well, what's going on with the money and the payroll, and you know what's going on with the admin, and who's doing this and that, and whatever. Like those two things work really well, right? Mm. So, um, don't have two people that are really good at admin and no one who can sell. That's you know you're just going to have a really tidy business with no money. Yeah, you know, like so. So you need to find like complementary skill sets. Um, so that that's worked really well. So you know, obviously, me and Marcus do Titan Marketing together. My wife and I do Youth in Business together. We did have other partners who helped us set that up, Andrew and Daryl Cramp, but we ended up buying them out early in the stage. Um, and then we have, I have another business actually, which hopefully we haven't talked about, which is Complete Prospecting, where we buy mm -hmm. up like mining sites and stuff like that, and okay. dig up gold out of the ground and a whole bunch of things there as well. So, and I have another partner in that one. So yeah, so like. Partners in business can work really well, but you just got to like be really mindful of who the partner is. Make sure that you're aligned ethically and that you know where you want to go. And, um, and you know, like your, your, your skill set's complementary. So, mm -hmm. yeah, definitely. Definitely complementary is a good, good advice. Um, I think that's so if anything, like even when you're trying to hire sort of staff and, or like for, for instance, in the creative field, you don't want to hire, you know, people that do something both like you hiring two people that do something really well, the same thing really well, when you've got other aspects where, you know, that so if you find that complementary balance, then I feel like you build like a better team in that way. But um I think you touched on uh the the youth in business. So how did that sort of start? I think you, you did briefly, you know, touch on that. But what was the, what was that aha moment where you're like, we need to make this a business? Like this is, you know, we yeah, need to do so something about this. It's crazy. Um, so so at the time, um, uh, like we just sold up some bunch of online businesses, right? And uh, that was been going back a little while back when membership sites and subscription stuff was was sort of just coming out, and mm -hmm. um. I was like, I think this could be a really good subscription business. And at the time, um, 
with some friends of mine now, business partners, Andrew and Daryl Grant, we're doing uh, some training on how to do membership sites. And like I had a couple, but they weren't really firing the way I wanted. So I thought, let's go listen to these guys. So my wife and I flew over. So I live in Perth to Gold Coast. was so like a four-hour flight or something. And um, I sat down for a weekend and like they were talking about all the different things that they did. And they're obviously like, you know, masters of that. And we said, oh, okay, well, this is what we want to do. What do you guys think? And they said, um, hey, would you guys actually like to do this as a joint venture and turn this into a bigger thing and we'll get you selling it from stage? And there was no universe where I was stepping on stage, right? Like, I was like, I was like, no, thanks. <laughs> it doesn't really work for me. And uh, and my wife was like, oh, no, it'll be fun. Let's, you know, hear them out. It's not. I was like, oh, great, here we go. So, um, so yeah, I was speaking to them and then they convinced us to get up literally like eight weeks later, I'm standing on stage, um, you know, talking <laughs> about this product, how we can help kids. Yeah. And, and the next thing we know, like the, the business exploded and it did very well, but I was like, that, that wouldn't have been something I wouldn't have done if I didn't have the right partner to sort of pull, push me along there. Yeah. And, um, and then from there, it went, like it, it went nuts. So I think what was cool about that is then we were then able to like reach a lot more people and kids are quite active, right? So like online's fun, but if you can get them in a room and play business games with them and teach them business concepts by doing, mm. that's really how they learn. And so, and, and, you know, that was very rewarding, you know, we would, by the, you know, we'd started off a bit smaller, you know, 50 people rooms, hundred people rooms, you know, to the point where we're not doing them at the moment just because it takes a lot of my wife's time. Um, we do like the online side, but Prior to COVID, we were doing, you know, massive rooms, like, you know, mm. five to 700 people uh, in a room teaching them about business. And it was, and it was really fun. So that's sort of how, how it grew. Um, but I guess it grew, it grew because we were already doing it with our kids, which is fun. And I think it also grew because the, we could teach the kids to get really quick results. Um, mm. You know, like, if, like I said, like they start with $20 and they can turn that into you know, a couple hundred dollars or over a thousand dollars or whatever, um, you know, that that's where it gets fun because kids live in that whole world of instant gratification generation, right? Yes. They're not going to sit around and wait. And I think, you know, the schooling system is broken in a lot of ways and um, like a lot. <laughs> and uh, I think that, I was, was going to say, I was going to say, but you already touched on it already. So. Oh, it drives me insane. <laughs> and then, um, and you know, and then, so I feel like, kids need to learn this skill set somewhere and you know what a great way to learn them by actually getting out there and doing that so yeah so yeah really cool so that's sort of how it started and and sort of where it where it's at today but um mm. yeah. i was gonna say that do you think there will ever be a time in the sort of australian educational uh, curriculums that this will ever be taught no um and i'll, t I'll tell you why mm -hmm. So uh, school is basically, if you look at the history of school, how it was created, it was created in like, um, you know, Prussian Germany. And it was around the turn of the Industrial Revolution. And they basically needed people to be able to count and run factories and come off the farms, right? So mm. um, the, the people sat around, they said, well, we need, we need people who can, and it was just after the Neapolitan Wars or whatever, where the generals mm. couldn't count and they were losing lots of soldiers, right? Mm. So they were like, well, we need to educate the masses. And there was a lot of pushback from the hierarchy that they were like, oh, no, we don't want to do that because, um, you know, they'll take our spots in the pecking order of things. They said, well, what we'll do is we'll train the masses. We'll do like a primary school where we teach them a certain amount. But if they want to go to high school or like university or whatever, we'll charge them heaps so only the really rich people can go. Well, hang on. That doesn't sound too similar to what we have today, right? And then the same thing happened England had a massive problem, you know, a little bit later, they were like, oh my goodness, we have these delinquents on the street. We can't send them down to the coal mines anymore. What are we going to do? Oh, look what Germany's doing. So they adopted the whole education system. Wow. America adopted it and we adopted it. And now we're literally like hundreds of years later, we can get the answers to any question that we want, literally on our <laughs> phone. I remember my math teacher telling me, well, it's not like you're going to be able to hand a calculator around. Oh, I remember that too. I remember oh, I showed that. her. <laughs> and, um, and here's the thing, like we live in a world today that's just totally different. But 
the whole point of what they were training kids to do back then was to become better factory workers and better soldiers. Mm. And literally we have a system that does those two things. However, they want to wrap it in whatever glorified situation. I mean, kids, are, like they basically teach rote learning and memorized learning mm. in a land where you're in a place where you don't have to have memorized learning. Like it's just so outdated. Yeah. Uh, on top of the fact of like the kids who can't, you know, look that way, feel stupid, which most entrepreneurs suffer from some form of ADD or like learning disability or something anyway, like hello, yeah. you know? Yeah. So that's totally stupid. And the other, the other bit with it that drives me nuts is even when they do teach entrepreneurship at school, even when they go, we have a special entrepreneurship program, this is what it looks like. So why don't we teach the kids how to do market research for like three or four weeks? Then they'll do a little market stall on the oval. And then if they're really lucky, they'll make, you know, a hundred bucks or 200 bucks mm. of which, they get to donate all the money that they made back to the school. Mm, mm. So they just taught them how to create a not-for-profit in a very long way. <laughs> so, <laughs> That's so true. Yeah, or even worse, right? Like here's the next thing. Okay, right, I'm going to go do an MBA at university, mm. right? So I'm going to go to a university, pay like tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars to actually learn business from people who've never run a business before. <laughs> so that sounds like a great idea. Now let me ask you yeah. like, what would you rather? Would you actually like work for someone who created multi-million dollar businesses for six months and then show you how to do it? Or would you rather go to uni for like for college for four years to get an MBA taught to you by people who've never run businesses before? I know. You, you, always, you, you always go to the person who's actually done it. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's like funny. That. It's even with the yeah, design industries is the same. I think, yeah, you always go with the people that have actually done it. Um, because you can see firsthand and they can tell you firsthand what actually works, what doesn't work. I remember doing business studies in high school and all oh, I don't I can't even remember most of it. it. It did get me inspired to to obviously start my own business later on, but it basically taught me how to, you know, make a what or a business plan and like account, do the accounting. That's really all I really learned. To be honest, <laughs> but there's nothing about you know like like you're like scaling and even just you know creating like a customer like a customer centric sort of product like you know what I mean it's all just like the admin side of it and it's like dude you don't even have a business if you don't even have anything to sell you know what I mean so yeah that's interesting I didn't even know about the history of of uh, the education system. I know this is the first time I heard heard of that. So that's you just blew my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. You know, and like what's really funny is like I left school early, right? Because I was like, I wanted to be an architect and you know that, that was the plan. And then I was kind of not the most well-behaved child at school. And um my dad was like, Well, why don't you go be an electrician? And that's actually what happened. And I was like, so let me get this right. I can earn the same amount of money and I can get paid to learn it. Or if I go to university or college. I actually have to pay them 50 grand. I won't get paid for like four years. Is that right? Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah. And I'm like, so I can get paid for four years and come out making the same amount of money. It's like, yeah. And I was like, sign me up to that. I'm not do this <laughs> at school anymore. So, I mean, like the, the, the whole thing is just so backwards, right? So mm. um, yeah, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Um, I guess what I really want to know is, you know, it, it, I always like to ask people sort of one of the more challenging times during their career of, of running businesses, starting businesses, um, and sort of uh, what did that look like? How did you feel and what did you do to sort of overcome that? Yeah, sure. So um, probably one of the most challenging times is we we're doing a new a new business launch with some new partners and um, we had a big, massive event booked. And I was actually having my fourth child at the time and my daughter was just about to be, was supposed to come after this launch. So we had this big launch. It was a big event. We're going to have everyone there. And um, literally what happened was my, my wife went into hospital, like an emergency hospital. She wasn't allowed to move from this bed and the baby was going to come like two weeks before this launch. Wow. And I was just like, oh, no, this is going to suck. And um, literally like, two weeks out so my wife's in hospital I got like three kids at home because I got four kids like business I had another business at the time that we just bought out that was really expensive a tax bill and things so we were like trying to sort that out mm. and um, this new launch was supposed to solve like 90% of our problems right so I like I couldn't not do it mm. you know like mm. I'd, I'd 
push myself into a corner that I was like, well, this, I've, I have to make this work. Right. Um, and basically what happened was the partners that we were doing it with a couple of weeks out said, Oh no, we don't want to do it anymore. Uh, we've just had this other business the opportunity that's come up. We want to go there instead and, you know, wish you the best. And you know, I know we said we'd do it, but sorry. And I was just like, Oh man, you're going to be kidding me. So then now I've got like this whole launch, of this topic that I don't really know anything about and I had to find another industry expert and all this stuff. And we found one, which was great in a couple of days, but man, they, they didn't know it. They didn't have anything to present or sell or whatever. So we had to like map it out. It was crazy. We were like building this thing, like just before the event and it was super nuts. And um, around the same time, my wife ended up you know, having a baby, baby didn't breathe, it's in ICU. Oh, so I've got wow. like all this stuff going on and like everything riding on this launch. And that was really hard. That was like, you know, like there's times where you're just like, is this really worth it? You know, like, um, you know, the wife in ICU, baby in ICU, like mm. business launch going on, like no sleep. I was just, and, you know, partners who have just left with these new partners that I now have to manage. Mm. I remember thinking at that time, I was just like, man, is this really this is really worth like is all the drama right now. And, um, you yeah, know, cut a very long story short, we got through the launch, the launch was successful, which was great. But, um, man, I was like just struggle town. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like I hadn't slept mm-hmm. properly in weeks and, and we got the other side of it, but that was really, really hard. And um, my wife did, and I do this thing where things don't work out and things are, you're going to have stuff, maybe not to that extreme, but you're going to have things that go wrong, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and we did turn that around. It took us a couple of months. And I think what we do is we go and have what's called a never, ever again dinner. So we'll actually go out like literally I do it with school teachers of my kids class, or I'll do it with business problems, business partners, like mm. marriage problems, whatever. Um, like we'll go out and my wife and I have a never, ever again dinner and we'll, we'll bring our notebooks and literally, you know, said notebook and we'll literally just go out write down like how is this never going to happen to us again yeah and we literally write it out and um and it came from like when we were first married we had like a family drama that wasn't really our fault like an extended family thing that blew up and i was like how do we never have this happen again and we just wrote it on a napkin and then after that we're like oh that worked really well we should do that again and that Mm -hmm. was so where the never ever again dinners came from so Mm -hmm. how we overcame that is like we'll do that you know, hopefully not that often, but on that one, we had quite a big one. Like let's like, you know, not put ourselves in a position where we have to do a launch around a critical time like that, you know, like that's crazy. And, um, or, you know, like make sure that our cash flow position, even though we bought this business and it'd be great in six months, like that isn't in this position where we have to do that. You know, like Mm -hmm. there's just so many learnings from that. Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, so for us, like never ever again, you know, I can't recommend that one enough. So that's sort of how we came out of it. And then, cause what it does is it, it makes you like recognize the problem for a start. How do we get here and understand it? And then the next part is well, how, how do we make sure it doesn't happen again? Like what are the steps, the actual things that we're going to mm. put in play or things we won't accept or what are our non-negotiables on these things? Um, so they work really well. Like if you find yourself in a situation at the moment where, things went bad or like not sure what to do or like how do I get myself out of this? If you sit down with someone, it doesn't have to be your wife if you're not married, but sit down with someone who like understands you and the problem and, um, yeah, you, you'd be surprised what you can come up with. So that's like one of the big dramas and probably like how we overcame it. So, Well, I, I love that idea, I, especially because you're writing it down on a, on a physical, something physical. Um, I've, I normally do that like uh, mentally, like if something does have go wrong in, in the business or something, I do I go through that process, but I don't write it down. So I sort of forget, you know, the the important parts of, okay, the telltale signs of not to go back there again. So I would think that I'd be like, okay, all right, this stuffed up. What did I do wrong this time? Okay, this, this, and this. Okay, make sure, you know, let's make sure we never do that again, never do that again. Make sure we're not in that same position as we were before. Um, which is good, but when you're sort of when you're sort of soloing one man team, it's but writing it down is so much better because you can always reflect back. So if you feel like you're going back into that situation, you're like, hold on a second, I've, I've I, something's up here. Let me read back. 
you can sort of see the telltale signs of like, yeah, no, we're not going to go through this. I've learned my lesson. <laughs> I've got a clear outline of what not to do now. So yeah, that's a really good advice. Really, really good advice. Yeah. Well, um, well, I'm st- yeah, a lot of awesome information today. Um, so uh yeah, do you wanna let let the f- audience know where they can find you, where your services are and yeah, sure. So um, look, probably look, if you want to connect with me personally, probably LinkedIn is a great place to do that. <laughs> so um, just say hi and um, I'll get back to you. I think the other places, if you wanted to check out anything that we do with the kids is youthinbusiness.com. Um, we have some free training, give away 101 great kids business ideas and stuff. Um, if you wanted to understand a bit more about YouTube marketing, like that's how we grow and scale YouTube ad, uh, businesses with YouTube ads to multiple six or seven figures. Uh, we run events, we're running events in Australia at the moment, um, probably next year at this point. Uh, we do have a place if you want to find out, we've got some free training where you can get things like how to write your first ad script. Um, we have templates and checklists and stuff that we give away, um, how to do all your targeting, even just like how YouTube ads works and if you're going to be profitable with it, some free resources on that. So you can check all that out at titanmarketer.com or if you want to shoot us an email, just at support at titanmarketer.com. Um, we can send you all those resources anyway. Um, usually for the, if I do a podcast with people, if it's okay, I'm happy to leave you just a Google Drive link where you guys don't need to opt into anything. <laughs> so nice. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, I'll, I'll add all the links in the show notes for the YouTube video and all that. So yeah, so we'll, we'll chuck all that in there as well. Um, look, if there's anything that I can do to help you guys personally, um, let me know. I think entrepreneurship can be a, a lonely voyage sometimes. Mm. And yeah. Um, yeah, if there's anything that I can help you guys with, let me know. Hopefully I've been able to add value to, to the listeners today or if you're listening to this. And um, yeah, wish you the best with your entrepreneurial journey, whatever it may be. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ben. Um, had a great time talking with you. Hopefully we can do this again sometime and um, catch up and, and yeah, chat some cool. more. Awesome. Yeah, anytime. All right. Awesome. Thanks. We'll see you guys in the next episode. Take it easy.